Welcome to worship this morning at First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. We're going to begin a conversation about how we organize ourselves here at, here at First Congregational in order to accomplish the work we're called to do. And this is a conversation that will take place over the next few weeks in, it will continue over the next few weeks in small groups and workshops. The first of those I just want to tell you about this morning will take place on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. I invite you to each and every one of you to join in one of those classes Tuesday morning or Tuesday evening as we talk about where each of us fits in that, in this organizational structure. In the meanwhile, as we begin worship this morning, take time to, to think about as we move through worship, as you hear the sermon, where do I fit? Where does God fit in the work that we are, that we are doing here? And as you do, also remember this, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Please join me in our call to worship. Holy One, dwell within us. Whisper in our ears. Glimmer in our vision. Right upon our hearts. We wait with open ears, open eyes, open hearts. Amen. to that point in our service where we take time to lift up the things that are weighing heavy on our minds and our hearts, to lift those up to God. Concerns for family, friends, our world. As we begin, I, I encourage you to take time to raise those silently or out loud. Let's pray.
God of new life. On this third Sunday of Easter, resurrection remains fresh on our hearts and our minds as a renewed sense of hope accompanies signs of new life that are beginning to emerge. Vaccinated friends and families are reconnecting, children are returning to school, and people are making plans for the future. For these and the many other life-renewing gifts, Lord, we give you thanks. Yet, reminders of Good Friday persist. And in our awareness of life's fragility, we call out to you, Lord, hear our prayers. As infection rates rise in many parts of our nation and our world, help us see each other as beloved siblings. Help us make decisions, not solely based on our own individual desires and needs, but also on the needs of our neighbors. Help us do what is necessary to bring your healing to our world. As families around the world suffer the devastating effects of storms, drought, poverty, social unrest and violence. Help us to open our hearts and arms in warm embrace. Help us to reach out our hands in generous support. Help us do what is necessary to bring justice to our world. as violence surges across our nation. Flood our homes, our schools, our churches, our cities, and our states with your peace until we become your peace. Soften our hearts and help us let go of complacency. Grant an extra measure of wisdom to those selected to lead. Instill in us a longing to be the change the world needs. And continue to remind us that your resurrection hope is here and now. Amen. Hear now our prayer of confession. Uniting Spirit, you call us to be your body, reaching out to a world in need. You call us to continue your mission, to feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, care for the infirmed. But too often we become so consumed with being the hand or the foot that we lose sight of the mission for which we are called. We divide the body into separate parts, each going our own way. We forget we need each other to be whole. We forget we need each other to accomplish the work you call us to do. Through our ancestors of old, you offer models for organizing our communal life, but we confess that sometimes we fail to listen. Fearful it will be too burdensome or fearful that we will not live up to your expectations. Help us see and hear anew your liberating spirit of love that equips and enables us to be who you call us to be and do what you call us to do. Here are the words of assurance. God's spirit surround us with forgiveness and love. 
God equips us with all we need to answer God's call to bring love and unity to a world in need. The scripture reading is from Exodus, chapter 18, verses 13 through 23, the New International Reader's Version. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve the people as their judge. They stood around him from morning until evening. His father-in-law saw everything Moses was doing for the people, so he said, Aren't you trying to do too much for the people? You are the only judge, and all these people are standing around you from morning until evening. Moses answered, The people come to me to find out what God wants them to do. Anytime they don't agree with one another, they come to me. I decide between them. I tell them about God's rules and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you're doing isn't good. You will just get worn out. And so will these people who come to you. There's too much work for you. You can't possibly handle it by yourself. Listen to me. I'll give you some advice and may God be with you. You must speak to God for the people. Take their problems to God. Teach them God's rules and instructions. Show them how to live and what to do choose men of ability from all the people. They must have respect for God. You must be able to trust them. They must not try to get money by cheating others. Appoint them as officials over the thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them serve the people as judges, but have them bring every hard case to you they can decide the easy ones for themselves. That will make your load lighter. They will share it with you. If this is what God wants, and if you do it, then you will be able to carry the load, and all these people will go home satisfied. This morning's scripture is from the Paul's letter to the Roman Christians, Chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. God's grace has been given to me, so here is what I say to every one of you. Don't think of yourself more highly than you should. Be reasonable when you think about yourself. Keep in mind the faith God has given to each of you. Each of us has one body with many parts, and the parts do not all have the same purpose. So also, we are many people, but in Christ we are one body, and each part of the body belongs to all the other parts. We all have gifts. They differ according to the grace God has given to each of us. Do you have the gift of prophecy? Then use it according to the faith you have. If your gift is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. Is it encouraging others? Then encourage them. Is it giving to others? Then give freely. Is it being a leader? Then work hard at it. Is it showing mercy? Then do it cheerfully. Join me in prayer. 
Gracious God, through the written word and the spoken word, may we hear your living word for us this day. Amen. Moses cared deeply for the people he was called to serve, but he was overwhelmed. I think our video editors did a wonderful job of illustrating the magnitude of the situation Moses faced. He was surrounded by people asking for help, but despite his sincere desire to help, what he was doing wasn't working. Many needs weren't being addressed. I think we can all relate to the frustration he must have felt. And I want to suggest that FCC has a lot in common with Moses. Not long ago, this congregation came together for a con conversation about the church's mission, about where FCC felt called to serve. You talked about the many needs that exist in the local community and beyond. You expressed concern for justice and compassion for those in need. But like Moses, there's frustration around how to get the work done with the resources you have available. On the surface, the conversation between Jethro and Moses appears rather simple. It's easy to read this story like a, a list of bullet points. You know, Jethro identifies a problem. Jethro offers a solution. The community is reorganized and everyone's happy. But if we skim through the story, we run the risk of missing what I believe to be a treasure trove of thought-provoking details. So I'm inviting you to join me in a search for the hidden treasures buried in this story. As we search this passage, think about how Jethro's advice and the response by Moses and the community he served may provide guidance for this congregation. Let's start by talking about Moses' dilemma. And he, and he had a dilemma. He was, he was an important, he has an important job. And it's a job he takes seriously. He's called to represent the people of Israel before God, to pray for the people. He also is responsible for listening to God, discerning how God would have the community live and act. Moses' job is to provide regulations and laws that would allow the people not only to function, but to thrive. In other words, Moses' job was one of governance. The problem occurred when Moses also took on the responsibility of addressing every concern that arose within the community. He couldn't possibly hear all the concerns presented in a day, much less have time to pray for the people. But someone had to do it. What was Moses to do? Congregations today often voice similar concerns, including FCC. The governing board is tasked with making decisions about finances and infrastructure, developing policy and procedure to guide the ministries of the congregation, and ensuring the church's ministries align with the mission God has called the church to do. But like Moses, board members also take on the everyday management tasks. Also like Moses, the impossible nature of the job becomes, in dis becomes disheartening. And hear me when I say this. You're not alone. I recently participated in a conversation with people from a number of different churches. And a, a common concern was the frustration experienced by congregants 
who want to reach out and care for a world in need, but instead find themselves overwhelmed with the, the work that does nothing to expand their ability to touch lives. But along came Jethro. It's important to note that the answer to Moses' dilemma came from outside the community. Jethro was not an, was not an Israelite. Sometimes we're too close to the problem to see a solution. And it can help to get an outside perspective. Jethro was able to see what others couldn't because he observed the situation from a place sometimes referred to as the balcony. He wasn't entangled in the process. Jethro recognized that the people's frustration and, and limited ability to increase their ministry had to do with their organizational framework. In other words, the process they established for making decisions and determining authority. Moses and the people that came to him for answers, they were simply doing what they had always done. But Jethro says, what you're doing isn't good. Jethro then invited the community to think differently about their administrative structure. And Moses listened. The starting point for change was a, the willingness on the part of Moses to consider a different way of doing ministry. Moses had to reimagine what it means to be a leader. The new way of doing ministry required that Moses let go of certain jobs, but he also had to let go of much of his authority. The story tells us that he divided and redivided the community into groups of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and even tens. And Moses' responsibility then becomes that of communicating rules to guide the, the way people are to live with the leaders of the various groups. The only issues Moses is to handle personally are those passed on to him by other leaders who find a problem that's beyond them. The everyday management tasks, the problem-solving tasks within the community were addressed by the other leaders in accordance with the guidance, think policy and procedure, passed to them from Moses as Moses listened to God. Now, if you're starting to check out because you don't hold a leadership position at FCC, hang with me for just a moment longer. I know we focused a lot on Moses as a leader, but transformation took place across the board. For change to happen, all the people of Israel had to adapt to a new understanding of leadership, along with changing their perception of governance and administrative processes. They moved from a system of dependence where they depended on one leader for everything to a system of interdependence that went throughout the community. The latter concept is embraced by the Apostle Paul. Our text from Romans today tells us that God gives gifts to every member, and God's gifts are given so the church can accomplish the work God calls it to do. Now, does this mean that every, every member is, a, is called to lead? Not in the sense most of us think of leadership. But keep in mind, however, that there are many ways to lead that don't require sitting on a board. Consider, for instance, what we're doing right now. Multiple leaders 
contributed a variety of gifts to create a structured and effective worship service in the same way the gifts of multiple members connect to create a congregation-wide governance and administrative system. Multiple readers are leading prayers that help plant pieces of the message into our hearts as we hear the prayers and pray along with their words. Instrumentalists and vocalists have offered their gifts for leading music that, that touches our hearts in a way that words could never do alone. And the lyrics written by gifted, gifted people beyond our congregation reinforce the claims made today in, in hopes of transporting the message from our heads to our hearts. But the organizational structure that created this service is wider than the screen you're viewing. A team of leaders, the worship team, came together to talk about the theme, the music, and who would participate long before the service. A leader scheduled recordings. Others recorded the many pieces of the video that another leader edited together with the wonderful graphics you see. And the structure is wider yet. The different gifts and abilities found among the people of Israel help to determine how their interdependent community would be shaped. Remember, each leader was tasked with a different job requiring different gifts. For instance, the person asked to oversee 1,000 people would have needed a, a very different set of gifts than those required by a person who was assigned to oversee 10 people. And Jethro didn't say to Moses, go find people to fill a particular number of positions. Instead, he listed for Moses the important criteria to look for when searching for leaders. Now, obviously, when you can talk about a community of a thousand, the available gifts and the mixture of gifts is probably larger than that found in a community of 200 or 100 or 50. Nonetheless, God supports the gifts that are needed for each setting. So what happens if some of the gifts are left out of the structure? About three years ago, while camping, I received a panic text from my daughter saying that she had been locked inside the school farm, and there was no way out. Call immediately, the text read. Unfortunately, that was the only message that was able to get in or out. No phone service. Now, now I'm panicked. So I started walking around the campground, and eventually I found a spot on the top of a hill where I could get a signal. We were in an area where with limited cell, cell phone towers, or at least towers that weren't aligned in a way that connected my phone with hers. Now, I want to suggest that our gifts for ministry work in a similar fashion with, within the church. Disconnect for any reason can diminish the church's ability to accomplish its mission. One more very important point to be gleaned from this passage is found in the last statement made by Jethro to Moses, wherein Jethro says, God so commands you. The implication is that organizational structures within, within a community of faith 
is much more than a convenience. It's God's will. Now, there's no scripture that directs a particular structure. In fact, throughout the Bible, communities of faith are organized in a variety of ways. But scripture does support the need for an efficient organizational structure that includes all the gifts God has entrusted to the community. Furthermore, scripture suggests an organizational structure is in itself a gift from God. Organizational structuring is at the heart of creation itself. In Genesis, we find God at the very beginning organizing chaos into something new. And when order was established, God said, it is good. So if anyone is feeling overwhelmed, know that God is with us. God is guiding. God is directing. God has given us the support we need to move forward. And in God, hope abounds. Amen.
Our prayer of dedication today, giver of gifts, you have called us to offer all that we are to you, our bodies, our spirits, our minds, our time, and our money. So here we are. With humble hearts, we give of ourselves this day. We offer to you the gifts you have entrusted to us for the sake of your mission. Knit us together into a community of faith, structured and networked according to your will. And through this community, may the needs of many be served. Amen. Go out from this time together with peace and joy, celebrating the love of God with everyone you meet. Go in peace. Amen.